Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram. And you've joined me today for a brand new teaching that I've entitled, The Number One Reason You Don't See God. Brothers and sisters, I believe that you and I are in a, alive in a time like no other, where Yahweh desires to tabernacle among us, where He desires for His presence to be upon us so that we can be the people of His presence to the nations. Just as He spoke to Israel in the book of Exodus and told them that they were to be a peculiar treasure, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So today, Yahweh is looking for a man or a woman that is willing to count the cost, the cost of of holiness, the cost of being a true disciple so that through that person's life, he might reveal his glory so that others might know that he is the one true Elohim. My question to you today is, are you willing to have your eyes open? Are you willing to lay your life down for his? Are you willing to count the cost to walk in the narrow path that leads to life? Are you willing to count the cost for holiness? Are you willing to trade your soulful life for the life that He wants to give to you? I pray that your answer would be yes. So brothers and sisters, without further ado, let's pray and let's get into this teaching and let's allow the Father to speak to our hearts and allow Him to bring change to us. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory today. Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. I thank you, Abba Father, that Yeshua came to die for our sins, to reconcile us to you so that we might be made right with you, so that we might be in right standing with you. But Father, He has not left us as orphans. He desires for us to be strong. He desires for us, Father, to be sons and daughters of righteousness, people who carry the presence of the King. So, Father, today I pray that as we get into your word, that you will speak, Father, the words that you want to be spoken into the lives of your people. I pray, Abba, Father, that you will give me the strength to convey the message as best I know how. And, Father, that every single person that hears this teaching, Father, will have their ears opened and their hearts, Father, changed and renewed by you. We love you and we worship you, Father, and we give you all the honor and all the praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, one question that I've been asked over and over in all my years of ministry is the following. What is my purpose? You know, over and over, people have questioned us. They've asked, what is it that Yahweh wants from me? What is it that He has called me to do? I don't know what I am created for. You know, the truth is that even I have questioned my purpose in this life. I've questioned it many, many times. And I've come to realize that the truth is, until we come to fully understand what we were created for, we will always struggle with with this inability to truly see and experience Yahweh in His fullness and in His glory. You see, because we'll always be searching for other things instead of being content with what we are being created for. When we understand that, then we will understand what Yahweh wants from us and how to be with Him in unity. You know, I believe that we might experience His Spirit at times, yet this is not His ultimate desire for you. He doesn't just want you to stand in a congregation and feel the tingling sensation down your spine and and, and feel emotional. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to be manifest among us. He wants to inhabit the praises of His people. But unfortunately, we are not seeing Yahweh in the manner that He desires for one specific reason. And I hope by the end of this teaching that you will know exactly what that reason is. You see, as I said, His desire is to tabernacle among us, to draw you to Him and to reveal His great love and power to you so that in the end, you can go out into a dying world and reveal that same power and love to the world. That's what He wants, so that you might become a living testimony for Him in this generation. You know, a couple of weeks ago when we did the coffee break, my wife and I were speaking. And one thing that I, I, I really felt is that we are so desperately looking for the next move of Yahweh when we should be understanding that we are that move. Yahweh is looking for a man and a woman through whom he can reveal his power through so that the world will know. We need to get our lives right so that we can become the move of Yahweh in this final generation. So that when the world looks at us, they'll say, hey, you know what? Those people, they know Yahweh. When you go to them, things 
happen because they are different. They are on fire. They are radical. They are changed. I want to be like that. I want to have my life changed. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we should all be desiring? That the world will know Yahweh through the life that we live? You know, brothers and sisters, one of the biggest lies of the enemy today is to convince believers that all they need is salvation, nothing more, nothing less. The theology of once saved, always saved is crippling the body of Messiah Yeshua. People believe that once they are saved, they are righteous and therefore they no longer need anything else. Because they have been made right, this automatically equals holiness. You know, because of this falsehood today, many believers don't see the need to strive to be holy. Now, the English word strive comes from the Greek word agonizo mai. And the root of that word is the noun agon, which actually means to struggle, to contest, to be in opposition to something. And what's interesting is that agonismai appears only seven times in the New Testament. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. And it is used in this instance as competing in public games. It's found in 1 John chapter 18, 36. And it is to fight or engage in conflict. But more often, it is used metaphorically to contend with perseverance, to strive to get to a place. And you know, Yeshua issued a command in Luke chapter 13 and verse 24. And he said to us that we are to strive to enter by the narrow door. And you know, he, he said that that striving is going to take something from you. And unfortunately today in the body of Messiah Yeshua, there are so many people wanting to get through that narrow door, but they have so much issues and baggage on their shoulders. And they are not willing to strive and contend with their flesh so that the baggage that's on their shoulders might be removed so that they can fit through that narrow door. They just don't want to deal with their issues. They don't want to look at their own heart. You know, brothers and sisters, the kingdom of heaven it doesn't allow for people of indecision or people of relaxation. Because the door is so narrow, we cannot take our wilderness with us. If we try, we will never fit through it. That's why we need to struggle. We need to contest. We need to put to death our flesh. It's also used in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. And Paul issues a command to young Timothy, and he says to Timothy, you need to fight the good fight of faith. We need to be in a war against our flesh and against the things that so often come upon us. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12, Ephraim was always laboring in his prayers. My question to you today is, do you labor in your prayers? Do you get down on your knees for the souls of many people that are still not saved? You know, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29, Paul, Rav Shul, is constantly striving according not to his own power, he says, but according to Elohim's power for the salvation of others. Do you do that? You know, the Bible tells us that what Paul's actually doing is he throws in everything and he sacrifices himself for the salvation of the people of Yahweh. The Bible says no greater love there is no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for his brother. Are we willing to lay our lives down to see the unreached saved, to see people transformed and healed and set free from the bondage of the things of this world? That will only happen when we have the fire of Yahweh in our lives. When we have created a place in our lives where He can dwell. You see, brothers and sisters, it's clear to see that there is a struggle, a contention that needs to take place between our flesh and our spirit in order for you and I to walk in holiness. We need to put to death the flesh. But unfortunately today, many on they are just simply unwilling unwilling to contend. They're unwilling to put to death the old man and its practices. It's easy to stand up and ask for forgiveness at a meeting and then go back into their sins while they're in the daily routine of the week. We stand up and we feel, we feel, we feel that we need to make right, but we never deal with the roots. We never deal with the issues deep down. We never put to death the old man. We never chop him off by his head. We just seem to tie him up. And then he gets loose throughout the rest of the week. 
You see, it's only when we are truly willing to die to self and live for Yeshua that our purpose will become real to us. The question is then, what exactly is our purpose? What did Yahweh say is our purpose? Let's have a look at what it says in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2. It says, speak to the entire Israelite community, every single person, and tell them, be holy because I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am holy. He doesn't say this just to the men. He doesn't just say this to, 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 to the boys. He says it to every single Israelite person. That their purpose before anything else, before their offerings, before any other thing that they do, is to be holy as Yahweh is holy. Brothers and sisters, nothing has changed. If you want to know your purpose, you need to walk in holiness. You need to be a living testimony. You need to be a holy person. Walking in integrity, honesty. Doing what is required of you according to what Yahweh has given to us in His Word. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, it says the following. He tells us now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then, only then, if you hear the voice of Yahweh today and you do not obey it and you are stiff-necked and stubborn, you're going to miss the mark. Yahweh says, if I call to you today, do not be stiff-necked, do not be stubborn, but hear me. We need to hear His voice. We need to keep His covenant and do His commandments. We need to keep His festivals because they are His set appointments for us. He says, when we do these things, then we shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. And you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all people, for the earth is mine. You see, brothers and sisters, Yahweh calls His people a peculiar treasure. However, in order for us to actually be treasured by Yahweh, this verse proposes nothing about faith. Take a look at it. It proposes nothing about faith. It talks about qualifications to be treasured by Yahweh. And these qualifications come via obedience and the keeping of His covenant. You see, today many think that covenant is either salvation. When I get saved, I enter into a covenant relationship with Yahweh. Yes, you do, but you're not supposed to stay a child. You're supposed to become a mature son that walks in all the covenants of Yahweh. You see, brothers and sisters, people today think that covenant is either salvation or Torah keeping. But they fail to see that there is more to covenant. And I urge you, if you haven't listened to the four-part teaching on covenants found on our YouTube channel, that you listen to them. I am drawing out of those four teachings in this teaching. And it would be a good thing for you to go and listen to that four-part teaching on covenants. The Abrahamic, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the final one being the bridal covenant. We need to be a people of covenant that progresses. Your salvation, brothers and sisters, is supposed to lead you into a life of purity and holiness so that you might become the bride. But you cannot be the bride or you cannot dwell in the kingdom of heaven if you do not live according to the constitution of the king. It's so important. There is more to covenant than what people have been teaching. You see, all of the main covenants have to do with maturity and holiness. It's got to do with who we are as people. And it's got to do with, with, with dealing with our own heart issues so that we might enter into that final covenant that everybody always talks about. But they forget that there's a process to becoming the bride. You don't just get saved and automatically become the bride. You know, the writer of the book of Hebrews understands these words clearly. He understands that there is a process that needs to take place in order for us to become the bride of Messiah Yeshua. And he clearly warns believers again that if they want to see Yahweh, if they want to experience Him in His fullness, they need to do something. There is action that needs to take place in the life of a believer. And you see, this action, brothers and sisters, has to be a conscious engagement. We cannot be passive in this calling that Yahweh has called us to. In this desire to be holy, we need to contend and we need to get busy doing what is required of us. Let's have a look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. And I'm going to look at it from three different translations. One being the King James, 
the Institute for Scripture Research, which is the Scriptures Bible, and then the Hebrew Names Version. Now, in the King James, it says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Now, he says, follow peace with all men. We are supposed to have shalom with our fellow brethren. But he is saying in this passage that we need to be holy because without holiness, no man shall see Yahweh. Without holiness, you are never going to experience Yahweh's fullness in your life. You might experience his spirit, but you will not experience the fullness of Yahweh in your life. In the Hebrew Names Version, it translates the word holiness a bit better, in my opinion. And it says, follow after peace with all men and the sanctification without which no man will see the Father. Now, in theological terms, we have justification. We are justified by the blood of Messiah Yeshua. But after justification comes sanctification. And many people think that sanctification is a once-off process. And as we get on with this teaching, you're going to come to see that it is not. It is a lifelong process. You know, in, in the Scriptures Bible, it translates that word, which we now have seen as holiness, sanctification. It goes one step further and it translates it as the following. It says, pursue peace with all and pursue apartness. Being apart from what? From the world. Being apart from the things of this world. Being apart from the system that defiles us. We need to be a separated people. A kadosh people. A holy people. A people that are set apart. A peculiar people. Why? Because we are different to the world. We do not look like. We do not stink like. We do not dress like. We do not, we do not come across as being one with the world. We are one with our maker. Messiah Yeshua. Yahweh. This is what we need to understand. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to pursue peace. But we also need to pursue holiness. Because without it, we will never see Yahweh in the manner He desires to reveal Himself. And as I said, in the Hebrew name, the word for holiness is sanctification. And you know, this is a word that many believers do not understand. And you know, today many seem to understand the word justification. Speak to people and they'll be like, oh yeah, I understand what justification means. But ask them what sanctification means and many people do not understand. Because they think, as I said, that once they've been saved, justified, made right by the blood of the Lamb, that they can now go on living as they please. But the truth in the matter is that Scripture is the only definitive source of truth. Scripture tells a different story to the once saved, always saved theologians. You see, the truth of the word is that we are to seek the way in the narrow path. We are to seek to walk in the way of the narrow path that leads to life. And that we should desire to mature and grow into the head who is Messiah. The same writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that if we are not walking in obedience, we might fall away from the faith. You see, brothers and sisters, sanctification is a work that is not 100% Yahweh alone. It is supposed to be 100% you and 100% Him. He gives His all, but we also need to give our all. You see, if you are willing to allow Him to work in your life, I believe that He will transform you and He will sanctify you and you will become the image of of Yeshua upon this earth. You will have the same image as the Son of Yahweh. You will walk in holiness and righteousness. When people look at you, they are not supposed to see Yosef. They are supposed to see Yeshua in you. And I've said this many times in all the teachings that the process of a goldsmith is found throughout scriptures. We see in the book of Malachi, how it tells us that, that Yahweh will sit as a refiner's fire and that he will refine the sons of Levi. And that applies to you and I today, that if we are willing, then the process of sanctification will be like a fire within us that will bring out the impurities. And just as a goldsmith sits and he purifies the gold until all the dross comes to the top, the end result is that when he looks at that purified gold, it is like crystal clear. And when he looks in, what does he see? His own image. It's a picture, brothers and sisters, of what Yahweh is wanting to do in your life. He wants to see Yeshua in you. He wants to see himself revealed through your life. So that when people look at you, they will know this person belongs to Yahweh. 
Now, sanctification comes from the verb sanctify. And sanctify originates from the Greek word hagiazo and the Hebrew word kadosh or kadosh, which means to be separate or to be set apart. Now, unfortunately, many in the body of Messiah today think that sanctification, like I said, is a once-off thing. That once they're saved, they're automatically sanctified. The truth is that sanctification is a lifelong process until the day that Yeshua returns. Let me say that again. Sanctification is a lifelong process until the day that Yeshua returns. It is fully dependent upon your actions and your willingness to allow the Master to prune you, to inspect your heart. You can hold that door closed. In Revelation it says, look and see, I knock. He is a gentleman, brethren. He stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't come in with a battering ram and knock it down. He knocks on the door of your heart. If you allow him in, then he will come and he will sup with you. But it is your duty after accepting him to walk a sanctified, holy life. Brothers and sisters, you know, the reason why many people are, are not on fire for Yahweh is because they do not allow the fire of Yahweh to work in their lives. So if we do not allow the process of sanctification, it will cause the Ruach to be snuffed out of your life. Sanctification is one of the most important processes in the life of a believer. It's the process that leads us into spiritual maturity. It's the process that takes us from being children into becoming fully-fledged adults. You see, if we want to be the bride of Yeshua, then we need to understand the process and we need to apply that process to our lives. You know, in ancient times, once the terms and conditions of the marriage were finalized and the bride price was agreed on, it was then that the groom would leave with his father to go and prepare a honeymoon suite for his bride. And this was a room that he would build on his father's house. You know, oftentimes this would take up to two years. Now, I want you throughout this teaching to see the connections between two years, two days, two millennial years. I want you to see the connections in Scripture between the number three and what Yahweh is trying to convey to us. So this was a room that would be built on his father's house. And oftentimes this would take up to two years to complete. And yet during this time, the bride was to make herself ready. This is so important. When we look at the ancient biblical wedding pattern and we apply it to our lives, we begin to see that many times we are falling short of what Yahweh actually wants for his children. We need to be in line with the pattern. We need to, we need to walk in the way that he desires for us to walk. So that when he returns, he might say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and inherit the kingdom. That's what he wants. So it was during this time that the bride was to make herself ready. She was to learn from her mother what it meant to be a wife. And throughout this time, she had to remain pure and dedicated to the man she had hardly seen, yet loved deeply. And while the groom was building the house for his bride, this is where it gets interesting. He would send her gifts, things such as clothing and other things of beauty. Now, isn't this just amazing? It's an amazing picture of what Yeshua has done for us. You see, nearly 2,000 years has passed, brethren, and the scriptures say that one day is like a thousand years. You see, it was Yeshua that said that he goes to prepare a place for us. He understood the biblical wedding pattern, and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. He also told us that he would not leave us orphans, but that he would send the promised Ruach HaKodesh, and that we would be guided into all truth by the power of his Spirit. And you know, the book of Ephesians tells us that Yeshua went down to Hades, but he rose again and gave gifts unto men, gifts that would empower us to live a holy life while we waited for our groom these last 2,000 years. Just as the bride waited for her husband for two years, he sent her gifts, so too Yeshua has made a way for us to be prepared for him when he returns, to be made pure, to stay sanctified. This is what it means. This is what he wants from us. Unfortunately, today, many in the body of Messiah Yeshua don't even know what their gifts are. They struggle to identify with being sons and daughters. You know, many today would rather call themselves servants of Yahweh 
which is what we all should be. We should all be a servant. And I've spoken about this in the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant has got to do with salvation. It's got to do with that blood sacrifice. And it's got to do with learning to serve one another. But as you progress in the covenants of Yahweh, you build on the previous. So in the Abrahamic is about salvation. We never stop serving one another. But we are not supposed to remain children. As we progress into the other covenants, we mature. But we take the principles of the previous covenant along with us. We never discard that. And unfortunately today in the body of Messiah, Yeshua, many people are claiming to be walking in the Davidic covenant, the third covenant. And they are proclaiming that they are kings and priests. Yet they've forgotten how to serve their fellow brother. They've forgotten how to wash another's feet. They've forgotten how to share the gospel of Messiah Yeshua with the brokenhearted and the destitute. Instead, it's all about them. It's all about their authority, their ministry. That's not what it means to be a true son. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn to reflect Messiah Yeshua. And we do this as we mature into becoming sons and daughters. You know, as, as we have come to see from taking a deeper look at all the various covenants, like I said, the four-part covenant series, you know, opening the door is actually the same as accepting Yeshua into your heart. It's at this point that we are accepting the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua and thereby desiring to know Him in a more intimate way. It's here that we enter into the Abrahamic covenant or the blood covenant, also referred to as salvation. And it's at this point that we are then included into the family. And, in, and then we can choose, brethren, whether or not we are going to mature or stay in the outer court. And we're going to look at that as it relates to the tabernacle. You see, the place of sacrifice and the place of the brazen altar was in the outer court. And we know that the sacrifice is, is a representation of the true sacrifice, which is Messiah Yeshua. We also know that the brazen laver is a type and foreshadow of what? Of baptism. Being, being mikveh into the body of Messiah Yeshua. And that's why Paul says, he says, you know what? We shouldn't lay a foundation again of salvation and washings and, and of all these things. We should go on to maturity. That is why we should be moving from that place into a deeper relationship with the Father. I hope, brethren, that this is making sense to you. You see, many believers have done just that, remained at the point of salvation. And they have absolutely no desire to see what is further in the tabernacle of Yahweh. They don't want to get into an intimate relationship. Why? Because it costs them something. They don't want to go deeper and study the word and, 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 and spend intimate times with the Father. That costs them something. It's okay, you know, I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. If I just do what is morally right. The truth is what's morally right to you might not be correct according to Yahweh's word then we might miss the mark. And brothers and sisters, I don't want anybody to miss the mark. That's why I teach. That's why I preach this message. Because I don't want you to miss the mark. I want you to be there in the presence of Yahweh. I want you to be right in the front as a person who is standing under the chuppah. I don't want you to be a guest. I want you to be the bride. You know, I have stated many times in all the teachings that to become the bride of Yeshua requires commitment and denying of our flesh. You need to deny your flesh so that you can live in His Spirit. The Spirit of Yahweh cannot dwell in a tabernacle that is defiled. You see, brethren, it requires desiring to be intimate with Him through a devoted prayer life. And it requires a man or a woman who is willing to go beyond the status of just being a believer. Yahweh wants you to be a disciple. He wants you to be a true disciple. One who is willing to lay it all down. You know, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 tells us, Just as the groom, as I told you, sends gift to his bride, so Yeshua has given us spiritual gifts, as well as the fivefold ministry, which is a gift to his body to help them mature. And I am a strong teacher of the fivefold ministry because I believe that when you put everything into perspective of this entire message and all the things that we have taught on this channel, 
you'll begin to understand that Yahweh desires for us to be perfect. In order for us to be perfect, and we're going to look at that word in this teaching, in order for us to be perfect, He has given us a gift. He has given us the fivefold ministry to the body to bring them to the state of perfection, a state of moral preparedness. Let's have a look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 onwards. And he himself, who's himself? Yeshua gave some as missionaries and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as shepherds and teachers for the perfecting. Take note of that word because as we go on in this teaching, we're going to see the word perfect coming across quite a lot. And it's always good to do word studies and, and have a look behind the meanings of the words that we read in the scriptures so that we can get a deeper understanding of what Yeshua is actually trying to convey to us. For the perfecting of the set apart ones. This is for, for the building up of who? Those who are already saved. Those who desire to be spiritually mature. To the work of service. To the building up of the body of Messiah. And then it says in verse 13, Until we all come to the unity of the belief. Brethren, some of us are not all at the unity of the belief and the knowledge of the Son of Elohim yet. Why? Because some of us have been on this walk for 10, 15, 20 years, whereas others have only been on this walk for a few days. That is why we need to be plugged in and we need to be in places where the right structure is so that we can build into one another and so that we can all come to the fullness of the head, which is Messiah Yeshua. That's what he wants. And when we do this, then it says in verse 14, so that we should no longer be children. Take note of that. He doesn't want you to be a child. He wants you to be an adult. He wants you to be a son and daughter of righteousness. But because we have stripped away the model that Yeshua has given us, and we have substituted these offices for teachers alone, teachers that might only have one gift, or that might not necessarily be called to break down and build up in a spiritual sense, we are now having bodies of believers around the globe that are spiritually immature. People that are tossed around and they are born by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men. And believe me, brothers, there's many trickers around. There are so many teachers around that teach for their own gain. In cleverness, and to the craftiness of leading astray, but maintaining the truth in love. You see, when we maintain the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into who? Into Messiah Yeshua, who is the head. We will grow into Him. You know, brothers and sisters, in all my years of ministry, I've heard believers say to me over and over, you know, brother Yosef, I cannot be perfect. And you know, the truth is in our finite minds, we calculate that it's impossible. And the reason for this is that we measure perfection not by what Yeshua says it is, but we measure it by what our society tells us it should be. And society's idea of perfection is warped. That is something that we need to understand. Society's idea of perfection is not truth. You see, biblical perfection is something we should all be striving for. You see, people no longer see the need to be perfect because we no longer preach the truth of scriptures from the pulpit. Brethren, instead of teaching about suffering, we speak about the best life we can have now. Instead of encouraging holiness, we speak about prosperity. You know what's interesting? Is that Yeshua himself said that we are to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Now, if perfection is unattainable in this life, what did Yeshua then mean? Let's have a look at what it says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. He says, Be he therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You see, there will always be two types of followers. Those who are just believers and then those who desire to strive, as we read that word, with agony, with determination, with contention to be a disciple. You will always find those that will follow like sheep and those that will strive to lead others to Messiah. The question is, which one are you going to choose to be? Brothers and sisters, the number one reason why we as the body are not experiencing Yahweh in the manner that He desires 
is because we are not pursuing our created purpose with zeal and passion. And that created purpose is to be holy as Yahweh is holy, to serve Him first. In order to be a priest of righteousness, we need to understand the concepts behind it. In order to be a priest, we need to learn to serve Yahweh first. So many people want to be a priest. They want to be a prophet. They want to be an evangelist. They want to be all these things. They want to go out into the mission field, but they are lacking the relationship that comes between the Father and themselves. You see, brothers and sisters, a priest served the people, but his main function was to serve Yahweh. We cannot serve the people if we are not serving Yahweh in spirit and in truth. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn to seek holiness, set-apartness. Living a Torah-based life does not automatically make you holy. Living a Torah-based life does not automatically make you holy. Just the same as being saved does not make you holy automatically. The truth of the matter is that our lives are to model the life of Yeshua. He came and said that He was the way, the truth, and the life, which was a reference to the tabernacle in the wilderness. You see, it's the tabernacle that speaks to us today with regards to how we are to live. We are to learn to emulate what was in the tabernacle. It is a picture of the death and resurrection and burial of Messiah Yeshua. It has got to do with His life. Today we have so many believers that are happy to remain in the outer court, the place of just salvation. It is the place, as I said to you, of sacrifice and the place of the labor. The place of the sacrifice and of baptism. You see, the beginning steps of our walk with Yeshua is found in the outer court. But we see that the entrance to the tabernacle also was called the way. And we know that Yeshua is the way back to the Father. And how does that happen? It happens by faith in His finished work. We need to believe that Messiah Yeshua is the Son of the living Elohim. Because the Bible says what? It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Yahweh. Every single person on this planet needs to repent and return and accept His sacrifice. And as we said before, when we do that, it is called salvation. And we are then justified by the blood of Messiah Yeshua. We are made right again. But that doesn't mean that, that it ends there. That's only the beginning point. It's the entrance into this better life, this, this new life that we live in Messiah Yeshua. Now, I've spoken about this in many teachings, yet I feel that I need to explain it again. You know, many times we can hear something but not fully understand it. And like I've said in so many of the previous teachings that maybe you've listened to, is that the first section of the tabernacle has everything to do with salvation and justification. It's also better known as the Abrahamic covenant in the four-part covenant teaching that I've urged you all to listen to. You see, by faith we are saved, and this is a free gift of Yahweh. But it's at this point that we are babies. Brethren, we are weak at that point, and we are unable to eat the spiritual meat of the Word. Now, if we remain at this point in our walk, we will miss the mark, and we will fail to see Yahweh in His fullness. We will experience the power of the cross and the work of Yeshua, but we will lack spiritual maturity and the perfection that will ultimately lead us into a more intimate relationship with Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, I cannot stress this point enough, that His desire is not only to save you, His desire is to dwell with you and to inhabit the praises of His people, to be one with you and I, and to empower you into the nations. This is why we have to seek with earnest to walk in the narrow path that leads to sanctification, to holiness, to being set apart. The Bible tells us, and we have said it throughout this teaching, that we are called to be a peculiar people, a chosen generation, a holy priesthood. But today, instead of being on fire, we have become fireproof. Now what do I mean by that? You see, we no longer burn with zeal and passion. We no longer seek to be set apart so that the fire of Yahweh can burn with great strength in us. And you know, so many times I see believers that know all the scriptures from cover to cover. They can speak Hebrew, they keep the commandments and the festivals, yet when the Ruach enters a meeting, they stand with their arms folded like a concrete pillar. And instead of wanting the fire, they seem to put on a fireproof suit. It's like they reject whatever Father wants to give them. 
Brothers and sisters, if we are to be a peculiar nation, a holy nation, then we need to learn to burn for our king. You know, the Apostle Paul equates salvation as the goodwill of Elohim. It's the least that you can do with your faith. And if you remain in this place, the Bible tells us that you will be the least in the kingdom. Let us not forget that many are called, but few are chosen. And the reason why few are chosen is because they did not prepare through living a holy life. And furthermore, they are not willing to endure tribulation. Now, hear me out here. When last did you hear a sermon preached? When last did you hear a teacher talk about suffering? When last did you hear someone correct things within the body? When last did you hear someone speaking about the righteousness that needs to be revealed in our lives by walking in holiness? You know, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7 tells us the following. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife prepared herself. You see, it is our duty, it is your duty, brothers and sisters, it is my duty to seek sanctification in my life. And I should desire to prepare my own heart so that Yahweh can dwell within it. You know, Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, and he says, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Messiah, Yeshua, will suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly, all who desire to live a holy life, all who desire to be righteous, all who desire to do the will of Yahweh, they shall suffer persecution. It's not only Paul that says that. Yeshua adds in John chapter 16, 33, in this world, in this world you will have tribulation. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12, 5 to 11 also says that in this life there will be times of stern correction. Why? Because Yahweh is a loving father and just like your earthly father disciplines you so that you might become a better person, so too Yahweh disciplines us. But if we are not willing to receive that correction, we will never become the people he desires us to be. He wants you to be a representation for him. Now I started this teaching by stating that one of the most frequent questions I've been asked in all my years in ministry is, what is my purpose? You know, Paul explains to us in Romans chapter 12 what is required from us as believers if we want to fully understand the purpose of our lives. And we need to start by presenting ourselves. You and I need to start by presenting our lives, our souls, our, our flesh, everything as a living sacrifice. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, it says the following, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is the good and well-pleasing and perfect, there's that word again, perfect, desire of Elohim. You see, brethren, we need to separate ourselves from the world. Nostalgia is crippling the body today, the love of things that have gone past, past events, things that we remember, that we think up again. You see, we love the world too much. And we are constantly landing up mixing our faith with things that Yahweh sees as abominations. So Paul writes and he says that we are to renew our mind. We need to separate from all that is unholy and we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And how do we do this? We do this by offering up our will for His will. And we do this through worship, through intimate times of prayer, through reading the Word, but I want to stress this, that reading the Word is only part of this renewing. You see, if all we do is study and read the Word, but never actually stop to listen what Yeshua is saying to us, we're going to miss the point. He wants to dwell with us. He wants to interact with us. He wants you to study the Word, but He also wants you to be silent, to listen, to allow Him to speak to you. Brothers and sisters, I want to stress this point to you in this teaching, that all the apostles... Every single one of them, they understood the importance of the wilderness tabernacle as it related to the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua. We even see this in the letter to the Hebrews, how the writer understands the importance of the shadow in relation to the fulfillment through the life of Yeshua. You see, if we want to see Yahweh, then we need to learn the pattern, and we need to conform our will to His by laying our lives down. And this is what Paul is trying to show us in Romans chapter 12. He continues and he says the following. He says, I call upon you therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim. 
your reasonable worship. He doesn't even say, this is the best worship you can give. He says, this is your reasonable worship to do this. Verse 2 continues and he says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove. Now take note of what it says. So that you prove what is the good. He doesn't say good, well-pleasing, perfect. He says the good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. You see, brothers and sisters, it is our reasonable worship to come and present our bodies as the sacrifice. Our wills need to die. Our flesh needs to be crucified with Messiah once and for all. Now, I stated before, I said to you that it was the altar that stood in the outer court. You see, sacrifice always comes first. And Paul is showing us how in Messiah, we are now called to present ourselves at the altar. And in so doing, we fulfill the pleasing will of Elohim. And we begin to mature in Him. And we allow the Spirit to purify us. That's what He wants. And this leads us into that final pleasing will of Elohim. The first will is just good. It's okay if you just want to be saved, but it's not his ultimate desire for you. His ultimate desire for you is to move from the good, the well-pleasing, and the perfect. And like I said, just as I said over and over so many times with the covenants, it is progressive. So when you move into the well-pleasing, you must still be doing the good will of Elohim. You cannot forget your salvation. You cannot forget what it means. You cannot forget the blood that redeemed you. And many today are doing just that. You see, brothers and sisters, it's at this point, in that outer court, that many believers simply quit. Things become difficult. When, when we get saved and we get mikvahed, we get baptized, and we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we get filled with the Ruach, that's when the Ruach begins to work in our lives and begins to do, as I said, that pruning process and the fire begins to burn the dross out. It is not 100% just Yahweh. It's 100% you and 100% Him. You can choose whether you want that purification to take place or not. And many simply don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to pursue the lover of their soul. They don't want to stop smoking. They don't want to stop messing around in their relationships. They don't want to do the things that will cost them something. But they want to feel saved. They want to feel redeemed. But they don't want to count the cost of holiness. You know, it's easier for people to be spoon-fed by teachers on YouTube or in the church than it is for them to make time to actually spend with Yeshua. I can get all the information I need on YouTube, but that doesn't change me. It's not going to make me the man that I need to be. It might give me a big head. It might give me a lot of knowledge, but it won't give me a changed heart unless I'm allowing what has been said to change me and searching it out for myself and spending intimacy with my Creator. Now the second covenant is called the Mosaic Covenant. And this covenant has everything to do with the Torah of Yahweh. And we have spoken so many times that Torah is not only the first five books, but Torah means instructions, guidelines, the way that we are supposed to live. It is the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, and it is called our manual for right living. It's Yahweh's word that helps us to renew our mind. It's Yahweh's word that helps us to mature, to become the image of Yahweh. It is what we do and how we, how we apply that word to our lives that will help us to grow. You know, for many, the Torah has become an idol, something they do instead of allowing the scriptures to change them. They just go to Torah study on a weekend and sit there and midrashing, but the Torah and the scriptures are not actually changing them. They are not allowing the scriptures and the words to renew them, to help them to be holy. You see, we need both the spirit and the truth. That's what we need. If we are to be a holy nation, we need the spirit and we need the truth. And we need to be balanced people. You see, brothers and sisters, if we keep the Torah with a religious heart, then we will miss the mark. I want us to see the words of Paul in all of this. Doing this only equates to the pleasing will of Elohim, not the perfect. So once you're saved, you're doing the good will of Yahweh. But now that you've come into the Torah and you're keeping Yahweh's commandments, this is still not the perfect will. This is the pleasing will of Elohim. It is the second section of the tabernacle. It is the second covenant in our walk. 
And I hope that you're beginning to see this and I will explain it as we go on. These covenants relate to time frames throughout history. And we're going to see that as we go on. You see, both Yeshua, Paul and all the apostles taught the understanding of the tabernacle as a tool for holy living. Yeshua said that he was the way, the truth and the life. And as I've said previously, it's a reference to the three sections of the tabernacle. You and I enter the way which leads to the truth. And I want you to understand that truth is that which is consistent with the mind, the will and the character of Elohim. A definition of truth apart from the man Yeshua is no truth at all. You see, the Torah is truth. And it's within the Torah that we find the will of our Creator. Brothers and sisters, the three sections of the tabernacle has every single thing to do with holy living and maturity. We need to learn to get rid of all other ways that we think can bring restoration. And we need to embrace the true way, Messiah Yeshua, the Son of Yahweh. We need to let go of half-truth and embrace the one and only truth and apply that truth to our lives on a daily basis. Only then, when we do these things, that's when we'll be ready to live our life, no longer according to our will and our flesh, but by His Spirit, and we will bring His life to others. That's what it means. And if you have listened to the, the, the teaching that I did on, on the Sadiq, and, and, and I spoke about the book of Habakkuk and how the book of Habakkuk talks about life and it talks about living faith. You see, brothers and sisters, when we have faith in Messiah Yeshua, then our faith will give life to others. That's what he wants. Brothers and sisters, understand this, that keeping the commandments of Yahweh out of love and, and, and that, what I'm trying to get at, let, let me rephrase it. We need to keep the commandments of Yahweh out of love and not religiousness. When we keep the commandments of Yahweh out of love and commitment, then we will keep our garments pure. And this is, this is what the whole process of sanctification is. It's about a love relationship with our Creator. You know, Revelation chapter 21 tells us that those doing the commandments have the right to the tree of life. Let's read it in two different passages, I mean in two different translations. The first one is found in the Scriptures Bible and it says, Blessed are those doing His commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city. The second one is in the NIV Bible and it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Can you see that in order to have clean robes, garments, in order to have those garments, the, the translators have translated what it actually reads. It reads, Blessed are those doing His commands. When we do the commandments of Yahweh and we walk in His ways, that's how we sanctify and continue to have garments that are white. Pure garments. That's what it means. We need to be doing something with our salvation. See, being saved and keeping the commandments is not the end of this journey called holiness. Paul makes reference to another group. And I want you to take note what Paul is saying what he's saying is that you can decide where you want to be. You can decide where you want to be in this walk of holiness. You can decide by your action or lack of it to be either in the goodwill of Elohim, salvation alone, or you can choose to add your, to your faith and then move past being just a baby into becoming a son and daughter. Now just as the covenants are progressive, so too is what Paul is conveying in Romans chapter 12. You see, each one builds on the other. To enter the pleasing will of Elohim, you have to continue to walk out the good will. You see, once you're saved, you have to continue in your salvation. We need to learn to pick up our cross on a daily basis and we need to choose to die to self and follow Messiah Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, I've said it over and over and I'm going to say it again so that we can get it into our brain and into our heart that the Abrahamic covenant is all about that blood sacrifice of Yeshua. It's about us learning to serve one another. When we learn to serve one another and we learn what the blood of Messiah Yeshua has done for us, that's when we are able to enter the next covenant, which is the mosaic or the holy place in the tabernacle. And it's here that we dig deeper in fellowship with Yahweh and we begin to do that good and now the pleasing will of Elohim. It's in that second section of the tabernacle that was the table of showbread, 
the altar of incense and the menorah. All those things speak about a deeper, richening relationship with Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, if we are willing to see the pattern of redemption, then we will have the eyes that are open and ears that will hear. And we will truly understand the will of Yahweh. You know, the concept of three is interwoven into much of the scriptures. We have the three sections of the tabernacle. We have the three wills of Yahweh, the good, the pleasing, and the perfect. We have the scripture that tells us three days until he will redeem us and raise us up. We have the three Elijah messages and the three times that Elijah lays upon the little boy. And I've done that in the Elijah teaching, which I also urge you to go and listen to. Now, before we go on, I want you to see this pattern of three as it relates to time frames. And it's even seen in the prophecy of Ezekiel's dry bones. You know, we know that the church has proclaimed salvation for 2,000 years and that during that time, many have been saved and continue to be saved. Yet as we can see, salvation is not the end goal of our lives. We are to mature into the head and become conformed to His image. Now the Messianic faith have taught the importance of keeping the Torah and the festivals of Yahweh. In all, in, in all of this time, and all of this that they have been doing, we need to learn that when we are saved and we keep in the Torah, that it doesn't end at Torah keeping. That we are supposed to progress into becoming sons and daughters of righteousness. And I believe that the sons and daughters of righteousness that are going to walk and move upon this earth in this final generation are not going to be bound by a religious label. I believe that they will be people that will burn with fire for the things of the king. And they will take the gospel to the ends of the earth in the power of the spirit of Elijah. Now let's take a look at Ezekiel's vision. And, and I hope that when we do, that it will make a lot more sense as we apply what we know now to it. In Ezekiel chapter 37, it says, And then he said to me, from verse 4, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. This is what the sovereign Elohim says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, I want you to look at this prophecy as it relates to three or a three part process to the dry bones coming to life and being the army that Yahweh desires them to be. We see first that breath will enter them, bringing them back to life. That he will prophesy and the bones will come together. These dry bones will come together and they will form as one. You know, brethren, this happens the day that we return to Yeshua and repent and get saved. Yet it's there that Abba's desire is for us to have tenants. He desires for you to have flesh and skin and to be covered by his word that is alive and brings strength to our dry bones. It gives us hope. And His Word builds us up. It builds us, as we saw, into Messiah Yeshua. It helps us to mature. And the end result is that He will fill us with His Ruach. And we will be ready to have His life in us. A life that we will then live out and reveal to the nations. You see, once we walk in the covenants of Yahweh, this will become a reality. And we will see the fulfillment of the next part of the scripture come to pass. And in Ezekiel 37 Further on in verse 9, it says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it. This is what the sovereign Elohim says. Come breath from the four winds. Now take note, this is a different breath. The one was being breathed into the dry bones. This one is coming from the four winds. And it says, Breathe into these slain that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath into them, and they came to life. And stood up on their feet a vast army. Brothers and sisters, in this final generation, Yahweh is raising up a vast army of people that are going to do His work. You know, in order for us to fully understand what Yahweh desires from us, and how this all adds up to the words of Paul, we need to go back in time when Israel was standing before Mount Sinai. And I'm hoping that you're going to be able to understand what Yahweh desires from us. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 1 to 25, we read something very, very interesting. And it says, In the third month after the children of Israel had come out from the land of Mitzrayim, on this day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they set out from Rephadim, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. 
And Moshe went up to Elohim, and Yahweh called to him before the mountain, saying, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and declare to the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Mistrites, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. And Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, See, I am coming to you in the thick of the cloud, so that the people will hear when I speak with you, and believe you forever. And Moshe reported the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Go to the people and set them apart today and tomorrow. Now take note of this. And they shall wash their garments and shall be prepared by the third day. Three again. And on the third day, Yahweh shall come down upon Mount Sinai before the eyes of the people. And you shall make a border for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go into the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall certainly be put to death. Not a hand is to touch it, but he shall certainly be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast. He shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, let them come near the mountain. And Moshe came down from the mountain to the people and set the people apart, and they washed their garments. Again, a reference to who the bride will be. They will have pure, clean garments. And he said to the people, be prepared by the third day. Remember, I said to you throughout this teaching, remember this, this constant reminder of the number three. Do not come near a wife. And it came to be on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the ram's horn was very loud and all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was in smoke, all of it, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and all the mountain trembled exceedingly. And when the blast of the ram's horn sounded long and became louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and Elohim answered him by voice. And Yahweh came down upon the Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Come down and warn the people, lest they break through unto Yahweh to see, and many of them fall. And let the priests who come near Yahweh set themselves apart too, lest Yahweh break out against them. And Moshe said to Yahweh, The people are not able to come up the mountain of Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Make a border around the mountain and set it apart. And Yahweh said to him, Come, go down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break out against them. And Moshe went down to the people and spoke to them. Now I know that was a long passage to read, but it's important for us to get the context and to understand what has been said. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that this passage of Scripture holds tremendous truth for the days you and I are live in. If you remember, Paul explains that we are to walk in the good, the pleasing, and the perfect will of Elohim. Now the word perfect is the Greek word teleos. In Hebrew, it is tamim. We have spoken about these two words extensively in other teachings, one of those being the life of Noah versus the life of Lot. And Noah is described in Genesis as a just man and perfect in his generations. It's found in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. And like I said, the Hebrew word translated as perfect is tamim. And it means, among other things, whole, sound, healthful, and having integrity. Now the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the word teleos. It's the same word used in Matthew 5 and 48. And this is where it gets very, very interesting. It means to be perfect in the sense of complete and entire. A better definition is perfect, complete in all its parts, full grown, of full age, especially of the completeness of godly character. So what Paul is trying to tell us is that it's the one who chooses to lay his life down, to walk in covenant with Yahweh that will mature and be able to know the will of the Father. Not only that, but it was in the third section of the tabernacle that the ark rested. And we know that the place of the presence of Yahweh was where the ark was. 
that is very important for us to understand. And it's in this place that the glory of Yahweh is revealed because when we enter into that third covenant, no more do we encounter just his acts alone, but we begin to encounter him as our father. We begin to be one with him as he desires to be one with us. Brothers and sisters, we actually move from being a believer into a disciple, a son and daughter that then reflects his character to the nations. You see, this third place is also known as the Davidic covenant. It's the place of sonship. It's the place of moral maturity and holiness. It was stated before, as I said, that only the high priest who he was the only one that was allowed into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. But we know that through the blood of Messiah Yeshua today, you and I have access, as it says in the book of Hebrews, by a new and living way. And that new and living way is his flesh. His flesh was rent for us. In order for us to be in covenant with Yahweh in this deep, intimate way, we need to get rid of our flesh and we need to put on Messiah Yeshua. And we're going to see how that plays out and how Paul understood it and how he knew that in order to be a son or daughter of righteousness, it takes us getting rid of our flesh and putting on Messiah. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand today in this teaching that the profane cannot enter in. We have to understand that we have to learn to live a life that reflects the character of the king. Yahweh will not share the secrets of the kingdom with those who are profane. We need to be willing to lay our desires down to be tamim, mature and full of his presence in our lives. And this is something that many fail at doing. You see, many want their purpose to be about them before it's actually about the king. I've spoken many times about the rich young ruler and his failure was that he was not willing to give everything. He asked Yeshua, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And the Savior responded by telling him to keep the commandments after the man claimed, all these things I have kept from my youth up until now, what lack I yet? And Yeshua explains and he replies, if thou wilt be perfect. That word perfect is the same Greek word perfect. Telios. If you want to be spiritually mature, if you want to be strong, if you want to have godly character, then go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And then come and follow me. Do you see what Yeshua is saying? He's saying if you want to be a perfect, that is a person that is perfect, spiritually mature, if you want to go from being just a believer and doing the commandments, the first and the second covenant, and you want to enter into the Davidic covenant of being a true son, a true priest of righteousness, then you need to let go of your inheritance and you need to pick up the inheritance that is found in Yeshua. You need to let go of your own will and the things that you hold on to and you need to do what I'm asking you to do. Follow me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. You see, brethren, there are preconditions to meeting with Yahweh and coming into relationship with Him, coming to His high holy mountain, His place of abiding and His presence. Coming to this place is not without cost. And David talks about who can come to the mountain of Yahweh in Psalm chapter 15 as well as in Psalm 24. And he says only those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who abstain from sin. And another translation says abstain from idols, things that separate us from Yahweh. An idol can be your television, it can be your cell phone, it can be your computer, it can even be the study of the Torah where it becomes an idol in your life. We need to learn something about the tabernacle of Yahweh. You know, we like to speak and say, come as you are into the presence of Yahweh. But we forget that with Yahweh, there is conditions. And that we all can come to the stake, the altar. But not many of us seem to make it past this place to really get to know our King and Savior. Brothers and sisters, it takes a man or woman who has crucified the flesh, the flesh of this world and desires of the flesh, to pass through the outer court into the holy place. We need to choose to move into a deeper relationship with Him of, of, of prayer and devotion. This is the place where He begins to reveal Himself to us and show us how we can become more tamim in Him. Brothers and sisters, He has given us His Ruach to comfort us, to guide us into all truth. But more than this, the Spirit is the fire of purification in our lives that is there to lead us deeper 
and purify us to become more holy and set apart unto Yahweh, so that we may stand in his holy place. You know, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 29 says that no flesh should glory in the presence of Yahweh. No flesh should glory in the presence of Yahweh. Now getting back to what it said in Exodus, it said Yahweh told the children of Israel that they could approach him and become his special people if they would meet certain conditions. And only then would he bless them in verse 5 and 6. And after the people agreed with his terms in verse 8, and after they accepted him as their savior, when they put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts of their homes, resulting in the judgments of Yahweh passing them over in Exodus chapter 12, then Yahweh's blessings could come only after they had met certain requirements. You see, salvation is based on faith and grace alone. But rewards and blessings comes based on obedience to the commandments of Elohim. Matthew 5.19 To receive Yahweh's blessing, the Israelites had to consecrate themselves to Him. And this involved putting away the filth of the world, the idols, which was symbolized by washing of their clothes, along with men's carnal passions, which was symbolized by abstaining from sexual relationships with their wives, in verse 10 and 14 and 15. And if you remember, I told you that you need to remember the number three. You see, graciously, Yahweh gave them two days to accomplish this. They had to get ready to meet Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, one can't expect simply to waltz into the presence of the mighty king of the universe in a casual and haphazardly manner and expect just to have everything given to us. He desires to give it to you, but he wants us to walk in the path of holiness. And you know, those two days that were spoken about in the scriptures, it is spoken about in the book of Isaiah prophetically, and it speaks to you and I today. And I started this teaching telling you that the bride would go away for 2,000 years. Yeshua has been away for 2,000 years. The groom would go away for two years, and he would send gifts to his bride. Look at what Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2 tells us. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Brothers and sisters, he has given us 2,000 years to make ready for him so that we can live in his presence. Don't you think it's time that we put away the things of this world and prepare to meet our king? I'd really like to bring some clarity to all of this and hopefully you'll get your aha moment. You see, the covenants of Yahweh are all about our process of sanctification. Yet at the same time, they signify time frames in the eternal plan of Yahweh. For example, salvation or the Abrahamic covenant had been the mandate of the church for the past 2,000 years, preaching repentance and salvation. Yet they failed in making lasting disciples that understood the importance of walking the instructions of Yahweh. It's then that Yahweh raised up new leaders within the Hebrew Roots movement, Leaders who taught the people the importance of keeping the festivals and the commandments. Yet today we see that they too have failed to bring the people of Yahweh into the promised land, to meet with Him face to face. You see, brethren, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenants represent what Paul was speaking about, the good and the pleasing will of Elohim. Yet they have failed to do the perfect will of Elohim. And just as Isaiah prophesied that in two days Yahweh would gather us, so too we know that one day is like a thousand years. You see, Yeshua has been gathering His children for the past 2,000 years. And we are alive now in the time of the third covenant, the Davidic covenant of kings and priests who will walk in the ways of the king and be able to stand in His presence because of commitment and holiness. They shall be the ones who see Him and they will be the ones who reveal Him to the nations. We are alive now in the third day. The third covenant, the third will of Elohim, the pleasing will. Yet many will let this opportunity pass them and be happy with just remaining a believer. Brothers and sisters, the latter rain is coming. And only those who have prepared to contain it will receive it. Yahweh will raise up many in this final generation that will do great exploits in His name. Yet at the same time, many will not see him, just like when Yeshua came the first time. These people will be blind and deaf. Many will be so deaf and they will not want to see him. Why? Because they will not have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Now the, 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 the introduction, or not the introduction, but the, the, the heading of this teaching is, 
The number one reason why you don't see Yahweh is because we don't have the eyes to see. To have the eyes to see means that you are walking in covenant with Yahweh. That's what He wants from us. You see, brothers and sisters, when we walk in holiness and we come out from among them, when we come out from those places of defilement, that's when Yahweh says something so interesting and He says, I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh, and do not touch what is unclean, and I shall receive you, and I shall be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says Yahweh the Almighty. You know, brothers and sisters, Daniel and the prophet Zechariah both speak of purification that will take place with the children of Yahweh in the final days. Both of those books tell us that a refinement will be taking place. That he will refine those whom he loves and he will take those who are truly seeking him and he will make them stronger. The scriptures are clear about those whom he's seeking. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom is for those who are pure in heart and those who come to the king in poverty of spirit, mourning over their sin and hungering and thirsting for his righteousness to replace their own. It is for those who want the kingdom at any cost who will sell all they have to buy a great treasure and that great pearl. Brothers and sisters, the way that is narrow is the hard way, the demanding way, the way of self-denial. We need to understand that. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, it says, And you shall seek me and shall find me when you search me with all of your heart. Brothers and sisters, the disciple who searches for Yeshua with all of his heart will develop a heart like Yeshua. And Matthew 28 shows us what the heart of Yeshua truly looks like. It's a heart which longs to have the lost sheep return back to the Father's house. You see, Yeshua longs for His people to go and make taught ones of all nations in this generation and in the time frame that we are in right now. There is no more time to delay, brethren. Don't you want to be a faithful bride who longs to make her bridegroom happy? Finally, I want to share the last few things with you. This takes cost. It's going to cost you something. And it will be a task full of reward, but one birth with some agony and pain. You see, the kingdom then is not for weaklings, waverers or compromisers. It's not for Balaam, the rich young ruler, or Pilate in Damascus. It's not won by means of deferred prayer or unfulfilled promises, broken resolutions and hesitant testimonies. It is for strong, sturdy men and women like Joseph, Nathan, Elijah, Esther, Deborah, Miriam, Ruth, John, Paul. Brothers and sisters, when we crucify our flesh, that's when we will fully grow into sons and daughters. Brothers and sisters, the life of inheritance and sons and daughters in Him is actually what Yeshua called the abundant life. You see, our duty is to die to self and put on Yeshua the Messiah. And I hope that as I conclude with this, that it will really bring understanding to you. In Romans chapter 13, verse 13 to 14, it says the following, Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in wild parties and drunkenness, not in living together and indecencies, not in fighting and envy, but put on Messiah Yeshua and make no provision for the lusts of the flesh. You see, when we do this, when we put on Messiah Yeshua, then Romans chapter 8 verse 4 to 5 and 12 to 14 becomes a living reality in our lives. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 4 to 5. So that the righteousness of the Torah should be completed in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the matters of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the matters of the Spirit. Then in verse 12, he continues and he says, So then, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh. You are not a debtor any longer to your flesh. To live according to the flesh. You don't have to live like that. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, then you shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of Elohim, these are the sons of Elohim. You see, what Paul is wanting us to understand is that this leading is not one off, but a continuous leading of the Ruach in our lives. You know, the word for sons is from the Greek root word heos, 
which rather than referring here to young children, actually means of those bound to a personality by close non-material ties. It is this personality that has promoted relationship and given it its character. You see, as we come to see, it's those who are perfect, spiritually mature, devote, proven and tested by fire and trial that are the true sons and daughters of Elohim. There is a refinement taking place, brethren. You are either on the side of the living or on the side of the dead. Those who walk by the Spirit, who live by the Spirit, who conform their characters to the character of Messiah, who choose to let the world die, they are the ones who are called sons and daughters. You see, Paul understood the process of becoming one with Yeshua. He understood what it meant to be an image bearer, a son and daughter of righteousness. And it's time that we begin to understand the process too, so that we might dwell with our Maker as He desired from the very beginning and become the nation of priests who reveal Him to the nation. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 in the Amplified Bible, it reads as follows, For those whom He foreknew and loved and chose beforehand, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son and ultimately share in His complete sanctification. In the same process of sanctification that Yeshua went through is what the Father wants you and I to endure so that he would be the firstborn, the most beloved and honored among many believers. Many believers that would be what? Like him, that would conform to his image. You see, Paul is wanting us to understand that it's not the outward man, but the inward man that needs to change. A metamorphosis needs to take place. We are to be conformed into unity with Messiah, brethren, becoming one flesh with him. We are to take on the image of the one who bears the image of of the Father. And you know, the Greek word image in this verse is icon, E I K O N, icon, which here means form or appearance. It's a word that speaks not of something resembling something else, not a carbon copy, no, but rather of something that is drawn from the very nature of something else. So, what this verse is telling us is that the final result will be a man or woman who has been purified by the inworking of the Ruach, and they are in union and fellowship with the Messiah. And this will cause Yeshua to indwell such a person and reveal himself through them and to them. You see, by conforming our will to his, we become a true son and daughter of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, it's our duty to progress. It's our duty to mature. And it is our duty to seek holiness. When we do that, then we will see Yahweh. We will experience Him and we will be strong in Him. I want to end off by reading you 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14 to 16. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts in your ignorance, instead as the one who called you is set apart, so you also should become set apart in all behavior. Because it has been written, Be set apart, for I am set apart. Brothers and sisters, when we learn to walk in covenant and understand that to be a son and daughter is to learn to live holy and righteous before our King, that's when His glory will be revealed through us and we will see Him and others will see Him in us. This is what it means to be a true disciple. Let's pray. Father, we give you honor and we give you praise today, Father. I thank you in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Father, that you have done so much for us. By sending your Son, you have instilled, Father, a way, a way to be restored, a way to mature, a way, Father, by the power of your Spirit that lives within us to be transformed and changed. Yeshua, you said in your word that you went down and you also went up and you gave gifts unto men, that you gave unto us the Spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. I pray, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that every single person that has listened to this teaching, Father, that they will go away, Father, knowing that you love them, that you desire for them to be fully grown people in your kingdom, an adult, one who is ready to take care of the kingdom of their father. 
Father, I pray in the name of Yeshua that you will bless them and keep them. I pray, Father, that every single fear will be gone in the name of Yeshua. Every single pain and hurt and, and confusion that the enemy brings upon them to believe that they are fearfully and wonderfully made, I pray, Father, that you will eradicate it. And, Father, that you will bless your children, that they will be strong, that they will be courageous, that they will be like Joshua, that they will go in and inherit the land. And, Father, that they will lead many to you in this final generation. Father, we bless you and we honor you. We thank you, Yeshua, and we bless you. In Yeshua Mashiach's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I thank you for joining me. I pray that you will consider subscribing to this channel. I also invite you to head over to www.treasuredinheritanceministry.com where you can get this teaching um, as a PDF, the notes, the unedited notes. Um, you will also be able to find all our other teachings. Over three, 400 teachings are on our website. So please take the time to go over. You can um, become a member. It's free. And join the community of believers and get to know others. It's an honor and a privilege for us to be able to share with you. Thank you.